Well, hello everyone. My name is Amelia Regan. I'm the director of the Master of Supply Chain Transportation and Logistics programs here at the University of Washington. And um, some of you may have been on before. We have a leadership in logistics um, series. And tonight we are very pleased to have Rick Miltimore joining us. Uh, he has had an incredible career in spanning all sorts of logistics from trucking to manufacturing and distribution and now to healthcare with a few things in between. And um, he has lots of experience to share. And I just wanna say, Rick, thank you very much for coming tonight and for sharing your experience with us. And I'll turn it over to Dan who wants to say just a couple of things. Yeah, and I'm one of the uh, the professors in the program. I teach the finance and performance management class. And one of the great pleasures I have is keeping in touch with the students that have come through the program over the years. And I was trading emails with one of the uh, alumni and uh, we were talking about the survey that the program has been doing. And we've been trading ideas on how she was using AI in her job and the things that we are working on. And then she said, oh, by the way, you should talk to my big boss, Rick. He's just, he's a fantastic person. He's a great leader. He's hes committed to lifelong learning and he really drives everybody in the organization to, uh, to continue to improve themselves. So I was like, hey, great. Can you send an introduction? So we've had a chance to interact and uh, I think everybody's gonna be really excited to hear what Rick has to say because I think, uh, you know, leadership I think goes beyond uh, our technical expertise and just the influence that we have an opportunity to have on people's lives. And I could tell from uh, talking to uh, Lizzie that, that Rick is one of those people. So Rick, we're super happy to have you with us. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm humbled. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to both you and Amelia. Just wonderful, energetic, passionate around supply chain. So it, that always inspires me. Well, thank you everybody for joining. I am Rick Miltimore. I am the Chief Logistics Operations at Providence Health. Uh, as stated, uh, you know, I, I guess you wake up one day and you've been doing this for 30 years, and that does include uh, a long stand in trucking, um, transportation, which is really the roots of my passion for supply chain, and went into manufacturing and, and, and large-scale distribution after that. Uh, Manage, manage, manage distribution centers across the U.S. from the Bronx to uh, West Virginia to Texas to Chicago uh, to L.A., Fatima Mall. And uh, in about 10 years from now, about last 10 years, I've been in healthcare. It's just wonderful, wonderful experience. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, but first, first, a couple of things. Uh, it's my honor to speak to you guys. Uh, I do have a passion for supply chain. I'm passionate about the vocation of the profession and where it's going and really elevating the profession. Uh, supply chain in general is just riddled with, everywhere I've been, it's been riddled with um, 30 years of uh, experience of, of bad supply chains where there's just opportunity to improve, uh, significant opportunity to improve those. So um, let me back my screen here. So a passion about modernizing supply chain, and now that I've attached it to healthcare, it, it, it doubles that passion because healthcare is an amazing place to be. Let's talk about, let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about healthcare a little bit. Can we go down? Let's see, hold on, different screen here. Okay, so I bet I bet when, you, when I mentioned healthcare, most of you don't realize, you don't think about supply chain healthcare. And when you think about big companies in the West Coast, you know, the first thing that's come to mind is you see on the screen here, you're going to think about T-Mobile and Microsoft and Costco, uh, Starbucks, Amazon, REI, Warehouser. You're going to rattle off all those major companies, but did you realize that Providence Health is the sixth largest company based out of Washington? I bet you didn't. And then you think about our supply chain. We move about $2 billion of supplies on, on our team. We, we contract, which is part of our supply chain, about $6 billion. Those are pretty significant numbers. Um, and this in general, healthcare, right? Healthcare, healthcare is the largest government spend. Uh, as you can see, about 18% uh, in our economy. It makes up 14% of the workforce. When you start talking to your family and friends, like, oh yeah, my sister's in healthcare and my mom was a nurse. And it, pretty quickly you get to, almost everybody you know has touched healthcare, been in it somewhere. And if not, they need healthcare. So uh, I'd like, like to you guys consider healthcare in your journey. Uh, let's go to the next slide and I'll show you what that looks like a little bit. 
It's unique in that healthcare is served in at the point of use, right? Where the nurse takes the supply out of the bin. Can we pop down one more slide. I'm seeing slide two. Oh, oh, no, I wasn't. Sorry. Let's see. That's okay. We go to slide slide three there. So in, in, we have about 600,000 bins of product that we manage. And in those bins is 100,000 different items. Uh, each one is managed carefully and planned. Yeah, can you go to slide three if possible? Make sure I'm looking at the right slide deck here. I'm looking at three right now. So the <laughs> next one I have is... It's, it's, showing, it's showing on uh, screen one here, or of uh, slide one. Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, hold, hold on a sec, technical difficulty. Just, just highlight the third uh, slide and then go down to the lower right where you've got that kind of a screen roll down thing there. Yeah, not that. Perfect. To the right, there you go. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay, so this is a picture of one of our uh, procedural areas. And that's one of six walls of supplies like that. Every one of these supplies is carefully managed an inventory level, a risk profile, how many days on hand on stock. Uh, each one of these items is is of, of high value. If if one of these items is missing and you're the patient on the table, you you know it could be it could it could impact you. So we have really no room for error. So you think about these bins, they have to have product in them. It has to be the right product, it can't be expired. So it's it's a high stakes game in healthcare. And uh, the complexity of it these are global global supply chains. Uh, we receive about 10,000 lines a day across our system. We, we send out uh, over 200,000 requisitions a week. So just a little size and scale for you. Again, we're moving about $2 billion of stuff through the fingertips of our techs that impact, that support our nurses and doctors across the system. We got about 55 hospitals, 1,200 clinics. We're, we're the largest nonprofit healthcare by size, by size of our service. Uh, certainly not the largest hospital system, but we're in the top 10. Okay, let's drop down the next slide and let's talk about uh, some current current affairs. So uh, as you can see, as you can see this, you know, the Suez Canal, it's, we, you all remember that you're all, you're all in supply chain, either you're in class the supply chain or your supply chain uh, invested to want to be on this. Uh, you know, when the Suez Canal, clogged, These, how does that affect us, right? That was 2021, 12% of the world's trade goes through there. You got a 400 meter long ship with 100,000 horsepower, All right? These things, these things take a mile to stop. And from what I read, you know, it got a little off course, maybe in the wind. Well, when you get off course in one of these ships, the only way to straighten it out, if you've ever driven a boat, is to speed up. Dan knows this well, he's a big boater. You, you got to speed up a little bit when in this, in this, with this style of boats. And, and when you're close to the edge, what happens? Well, it's like an airplane wing, right? It just it sucks you further in. So this thing, they get more power from what I could tell, and it just augers in. Well, it shut down 12% of the shipping for, for eight days, right? So that's the kind of thing that impacts us that we try to build into our supply chain that we were aware of and monitoring. Uh, the next one was during COVID, we'll talk about COVID in a minute, was the Long Beach one. That's the picture in the upper left, if you guys remember. And, and some of you, some of you folks are working in supply chain now. I understand it. You know that one was pretty rough. That was we were we were on a recovery plan from COVID, and um, we think we're recovering. We got all these things affecting us: labor markets and raw materials in our global supply chain. And then the ports no longer work. Remember the containers weren't flowing. We had to. I think the president had to get involved to get some incentives to move the containers or blocking the ports. We had over 100 ships waiting to unload. And um, th this, this uh, at the time, 40% of the global US demand came through that port. And now you got 100 ships, five times normal. Well, we were in, we were in contact with the, the uh, port authority down there. And they said, okay, your, your stuff's on the eighth ship out there in the bay and we'll, we'll prioritize you and we'll get you in tomorrow. We'll pull that ship in. We'll try to find that container. It didn't really work as well as it sounds. And then we pull the ship in, get the container ship in, and then we'd be like, 
well, we got the product here, but there's no drainage company because they're backlogged. And then we got the drainage company. Okay, there's no warehouse to put it in their backlog. There's no labor to offload it. It was just an incredibly tough time. And you're running out of product. And we literally were. I'm thinking those those bins I was showing you. Product in those bins is on this container ship. And, and now what do you do, right? So you start putting things in allocation. You start doing substitutes. You start working with your clinicians on substitute products. Everything just gets super hard. And when you go from almost no item allocations to 10,000 items allocation, it was very daunting to our team. Um, so the next the next picture there is the the, the Houthi, Houthis attacks that's happened in the Red Sea. You know, 30% of the global containers moved through there. Um, so it hasn't affected us totally because our suppliers are taking a long way, taking 14 days more. Well, what does that mean in our supply chain? How does it affect us? We had... Um, I was, I was talking about this at a speech at the University of Tacoma and that day is when the bridge in Baltimore got hit and collapsed and, you know, that's the ninth largest hub and for foreign goods. So, you know, it's five in the morning, we're on the phone going, hey, what, do we have product in that port? Do we have product coming in that port? What does it mean for our supply chain? And then of course, uh, the other one that's not on the screen is cyber attacks. We got hit about, to about a month ago on our pharmaceutical side, cyber attack hit us. And our doctors couldn't do a digital prescription for uh, serving patients. So supply chain jumps in and we have a print network we manage, print on demand, and we're printing off manual prescription sheets that are highly controlled, have to have a chain of custody all the way through, and we're printing those and sending them and shipping them. So, so supply chain touches everything, and it's been uh, an interesting time. Let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about COVID a little bit. It's an interesting story. I think, I think it's uh, a good one. I won't spend the whole time talking about COVID because I could, because we lived it. We're in the Northwest. I think most of you know, in January of uh, 2019, or 2020, COVID-19, 2020, the first patient was our medical, uh, was at the medical site in Everett, the hospital up there. The um, At the time, they hit the news. I remember you guys, we, if you remember the news, uh, Everett Swedish site had a patient, but nobody really knew what it meant. And most supply chains in the US were a little bit numb to it. They were thinking, well, it won't affect us. We're, we'll be prepared. But I, I was working with one of our distributors and they said, they came in our office and Renton said, Rick, the Chinese New Year just got delayed. And that happens like in February, March, February of every year. And um, they just delayed the Chinese New Year, uh, extended it. And I said, well, regardless of what COVID does in the US, if most of your stuff is produced in China, most of your plastics and consumables, and most of the things you consume in a hospital are disposables, if, if the production lines are shut down, what does that look like? So we got the whiteboard out, we started mapping it, we started doing, put some math to it. And we said, we're gonna run out of supplies in April. And so we immediately jumped on the phone and just started dialing and trying to get PPE. Because the time was all about PPE, right? Which is your N95s, your goggles, your face shields, your, your gowns, your bouffants, shoe covers. It was just basic PPE. And then, um, so we, we just started dialing. We actually found a supplier said, hey, I got some supplies at N95s and uh, you can order them. They didn't speak English very well. It was around the globe. They were on different hours. And we, we had to cut this gigantic check. And this is early, early on. This is like shortly after the, this thing hit. And we were going to our CFO and saying, like, we need a this sizable check in the millions of dollars. And he's like, I, what are you doing? We have a cash flow issue. The hospitals literally are shut down from surgery. Surgeries drive the revenue in the hospitals, which is a whole other story because we spent the next three years with minimal surgeries, taking care of patients on Medicare and Medicaid with COVID, which we lose money on those patients. So we've lost billions of dollars through this process. If you don't do surgeries with they're paid by the insurance companies, hospitals don't work. That's just how that's how the finances work. So there was some concern about um, how we were going to fund this check. Well we ended up spending um, probably I'm gonna throw a number out, don't quote me on this, hundreds of millions of dollars on PPE over the next three years, above and beyond our normal run rate. We just had to do that to protect our clinicians. And remember for a while there, everybody had the mandatory and then fives, mandatory gown, every room in and out, on, doff it on, you'd throw it away. We were burning through 
pallets and pallets of PPE. And so um, in April, when April came, if you're watching the news, other healthcare systems in the US were on CNN with doctors wearing garbage bags for protection and other healthcare systems were being sued for fall, uh, counterfeit masks and not having the right masks for their clinicians. And we, we um, thank, thank God we had the right gear, we stockpiled, we survived it. And I'm really proud to say that we got through COVID without uh, impacting patient care. So that was pretty substantial. We did end up propping up giant warehouses of product. A lot of it expired at the end. I think every health system had, has gone through that. Uh, so let's just talk about this further played out. So what, what did COVID do for us that's good though? It really elevated supply chain. In a lot of industries, including healthcare, supply chain's not necessarily at the forefront of the executive table. It might, it might, it's important, but it's not always, um, it's not always center to uh, the top of the executive chart. So like Walmart gets it, right? Walmart always put their supply chain first. They were the first ones to invest in major fleets. They, they got that right. And they ended up winning because of that. Other orgs haven't figured that out. So, so this, this actually did that. We had presentations to uh, every morning at 6.30 in the morning to a thousand leaders representing our supply chain uh, reliability. We, uh, it elevated supply chain. It opened doors for us and it really forced us to take every bit of inventory in our health system and put it into our ERP, which sounds simple, sounds obvious, but if you can't measure it, you can't have it in your system, you can't manage it. And there was pockets of things like PPE, respiratory things that sat outside of our ERP. It really forced us to do it right. And so we have all those things in stock, managed properly. Um, okay, so it also forced us to rethink, this is important for, for folks interested in how the end to end of the supply chains. It really forced us to rethink our strategies, right? So we we've almost forced us to work with our partners to deglobalize, you know, or at least move to other countries, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, South America, force our vendors to say you can't single source. We had um we had major product lines that the strategy has always been to single source all the way down to the raw materials, and that made a lot of sense. Well, through this, we found out in some cases all the manufacturers of item X actually pulled from the single, same single source supplier. And we, so now we're looking upstream saying, we, we've got to look at that and say, you, we, you have to diversify if you want to do business with us. You have to keep X number of days on hand if you want to do business with us. It has to be in the contract. We, we built risk sensing tools to, to evaluate this, monitor it. It really has changed our entire sourcing strategy, which is good, which has really brought us up to um, current time and how we think about reliability, inventory reliability, and risk sensing. Okay, and then the last thing COVID did that for us that changed our industry and changed every industry is it really it really created the work from home model, which I don't want to skip over that because it was that moment in time that Teams took off, and Microsoft took off, and we're here today on Zoom virtually speaking to you guys, and it may not have happened without, without uh, COVID, to be honest. It really could have... Uh, instigated all that. Okay, right on schedule. Let's um, let's shift gears, enough of COVID. We can, I can take questions at the end. There might be questions about COVID, that's fine. Um, let's talk about just changes, changes in supply chain. So I mentioned I've been doing this for a little while. And just think about, it's just, just kind of fun to sit back and think about what, what it has 30 years looked like in supply chain. I know, I know Dan, Dan and Amelia, we could reminisce this and have some fun thinking about it. You know, but 30 years ago, all the news was NAFTA. Like now, if you're if you're coming to supply chain now, you just assume NAFTA, Mexico is our largest shipping partner. No, 30 years ago, that was all um, being designed. 30 years ago, there was no standard 53 foot trailer with a class eight truck. Like when I started in trucking 30 years ago, there was cab overs and different length axles and different length trucks and it was quite, you know, doubles and triples. It was a very different model. Some of those things still exist, but that whole industry's changed. 30 years ago, the internet was just coming out. So we did, um, I know that sounds weird because we live and die by it, everything we do now, but we did all our load, load booking through EDI. And we're like, well, we don't really need the internet. We have EDI. It's, however that works, it's magic. It comes across an 856 and there's an order and we accept the order and it works. Well, what did, what did the internet do? It, it really changed the whole model of trucking. Now you have all these private private 
carriers that just go on their phone and book a load. Right? That 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 didn't exist, um, like it was like it does today. It really changed trucking. Uh, Thirty years ago, uh, well, twenty years ago, the book uh, Walmart Effect. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Came out and it talked about outsourcing in China, right? Walmart really was the first one to say we're driving down prices. You might remember those commercials when you're a kid watching them. Well, how they drive prices down? They said if you want to do business with us, you have to go to China because you're too expensive. We want to be lowest cost. Therefore, you need to produce it cheaper. And they really they set up those channels and pretty much started every product line going to China. And uh, that book was 20 years old. 40 years ago, the book The Goal by Goldrat was written. I imagine a few of you have read, read that one. Yeah. That one was life changing, right? That book talked about inventory is not an asset. Inventory is a cost. It's like totally changed how we think about supply chains and it really opened our eyes to um, bottlenecks and constraints. It's a good book still to read today. But that was 40 years ago. So um, then we watched this deconsolidation model pop up, you know, the, the Target deconsol down the street, the Home Depot deconsol centers. Those didn't exist 30 years ago. That whole model, bring it in, break it down, um, ship it to the second warehouse to ship out to the stores. Uh, we didn't even have that in the Northwest 30 years ago. It was all coming out of the LA ports. Oh, just in time inventory, the growth of the private fleets, uh, things like trailer and flat car. The hours of service rules changed in that period for truckers. That was a big deal. All the emission standards changed. That rocked trucking pretty hard when the new standards came out. And then you had routing software, business intelligence capabilities. When I started, things were on green bar. You run a report, you look at all your loads, see what made sense, did you make money? It's very different today. I sound old. Uh, and then geo tracking trailers, electronic logs, you know, 4G in the last few years, 4G has really changed how loads are booked in trucking and how fast things move and how fast uh, bids are analyzed. Bids used to be every three years. Now they're whenever they want to send a bid out, computers kick back the price and loads shift. Um, but, you know, the brokerage models changed. And since since 2000, it's, it's fourfold now more brokerage. You see less big fleets out there and the fleets have all shrunk. Every major fleet, trucking fleet has shrunk. But the broker, uh, the, as the barriers come down, all you need is a phone, phone and a truck and some insurance. You can log on and pick a load up direct for the uh, shipper or through a brokerage party. And that's grown about 20% of transportation. And right, right before our eyes, all this has happened. And then and then Amazon happened, right? Kind of, I remember when it first came out, their stock was like 25 cents and, and it was books. And uh, again, now we just take it for granted. So what's happened in the last, what's happened in the last 10 years? So the last 10 years, there's been a lot of talk of RFID. And these are things like that were supposed to be disruptive change. I don't think really did. RFID didn't change the world in my, in my world, my opinion. And I've ran some big DCs and warehouses. Blockchain was supposed to change the world a couple of years ago. It made some people rich, but I don't, I don't think it changed our world per se. Uh, drones was all the rage. There's a lot of talk still about drones. We have a robot in one of our hospitals that pick stuff up in the supply room and can run it up to where the clinician is. It's pretty cool. Um, but it didn't really change. It didn't like really change our world. Um, I think you've seen some crowd sharing with freight. Virtual reality was supposed to change some supply chains. Don't think it did. Autonomous driving, we'll see. Uh, Camera-based inventory transactions. That's when we're, we're messing with some AI and cameras in, a, in our clinic space. You set the item down, it takes a picture of every angle and, and, and registers it. That, that hasn't really changed us completely. I think Amazon even shut down their camera-based stores, what I've heard. Um, so, you know, I think the, the thing that's coming up, sneak up on us is new new channels. Think about TikTok. Everybody on here probably watches TikTok once in a while. But TikTok could be the next Amazon. Could be. Because there's more and more distribution through, it's, it's becoming a distribution network if you think about it. Okay, so now here, where are we at today? Um, so I think there's some things that are, are disruptive that's happening today. Number one is uh, you're going to see a lot more of this deglobalization and reshoring from China. You know, the, uh, Biden announced this morning, I believe, new tariffs on quite a few products. It may not impact the products directly that that we have today, but that that's a real change. That's a real shift. One to keep an eye on. Um, I think the the cybersecurity issues are are very real. And in supply chain, you know, remember when Target Target got hit and they lost, like it came through a vendor through the registers. Like supply chain is a back channel to get into an organization and really do some havoc. And we're, we're really concerned about supply, uh, about the threats of that in our space. Uh, I think obviously digital transformation. I know we got some experts on this call. I know Millie is um, 
the expert in this space. But you know, we're at the forefront of AI, of course, and it'll probably come up in our questions. What's Providence doing with AI? We're doing everything we can. We're doing everything we can. Um, the idea is we, we call it a co-pilot. Microsoft uses that word. How do you take a clinician that spends 30 to 50% of the time doing non-value added work and use AI so the clinician can do 90% value added work, right? Just, just think about the benefits of that. There's a shortage of clinicians across the US and then the benefit of the care they can give. The same thing's happening in other spaces. I was talking to my friend who runs a, a network of truck dealerships. And he says, yeah, we're using AI to tell the mechanic what part is broken when they plug the computer in. It says, replace this part right here. The AI is telling them that. Um, so it's gonna be the same with the human body. But we're on a supply chain call, so let's talk about how we're using supply chain, right? How do we, we're already using it multiple ways. We're using it um, in the clinic space, we said with a camera, but there's AI involved in that, how it takes that item and it magically, it looks at different parts of the box, not just the barcode, and it, it memorizes and learns and knows, oh yeah, last time I took this and I had this piece of data, it was this item, makes it easier so, so you can be easily easier picture taken. Um, we're using it. Uh, we're using it in our procurement area, right? We do a lot of work through offshoring, and there's a lot of transactions, just over and over repeat transactions. How do you use this to be more efficient? So to us, it's not about reducing jobs. We're not. Uh, we're not reducing any jobs in our footprint. It's about how do we do more value add, um, more work, more patient care, right? And that's that's really the mantra behind it. And the, the thing I want to say about AI too is, you know, it is a, it is a, you know, if, if today it's one plus one equals one and a half in healthcare. How do we get one plus one to equal five, right? How do we get one plus one um, with AI to make us all more efficient? But it takes AI, as you guys know, it takes a lot of data. And we have a lot in healthcare. We have tons of data. We have a great ERP we put in last year. Um, and there's more data, you know, to do with. But to really get to that learning AI, the integrated, adaptive, what do we call it? It takes billions of records, right? So you think about healthcare, we have we have 10,000 contracts. Some of them are 100 pages long. They're required by law to be reviewed on a regular basis. Different than other industries, regulation really overlays healthcare. You have to, to have to review these contracts and manage them. Where How's AI gonna fit into that? I would imagine, I would imagine it's gonna help us in that space as well. Um, and then the thing is we talked earlier about supply disruptions. We talked about Suez Canal and the Baltimore Bridge, whatever. How can we use AI to analyze our network, see those risks across our suppliers, the suppliers that they're connected to and the suppliers they're connected to? We have one, we have one supplier that uh, we've been partnering with them because their fill rates aren't where we want them to be. They have like 50 direct vendors. But when we peel the onion back, those vendors have like 1,100 vendors supporting them of raw material. And like you got to look, you got to look vertically up into that supply chain to really build a resilient model. And we need AI's help because now you're talking millions of records and data and history. And then once you have all that data, you can start building your risk profiles. You can start keeping the right amount of inventory, right? You can, I'm sure you guys study the bullwhip effect. Like how do you how do you start reducing those kind of things as you're as you're using AI um, to become a better supply chain? I'm I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited about where it's going to take us, what it's going to do. Um, okay. So I think we're, we're good on time. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk a couple things and tips and tips and what to do and what not to do. And then I will take it for questions. So, so first of all, um, my first, I'm gonna give you three things not to do. So I'm kind of shifting gears here, three things not to do, uh, that I mean from the bottom of my heart, mistakes that I've made, mistakes I've seen people make. The first one is. I think most of the people in this call are students. You guys have worked really hard. You guys are awesome. I mean, you're the top, of, you're the cream, you're the top of the class, University of Washington, MBA, supply chain. The industry needs you. We need you. Um, need you to come out and make a difference. Okay, so the first mistake you're going to make is not bringing everything you just learned. I can tell you everything you learned. There isn't a class that I took that somewhere in my career I look back and go, I could use something from that class, every single course. And uh, you guys have all studied statistics and regression and you've studied uh, 
the science of operations and replenishment and economic order quantity. And you guys have studied uh, negotiations and you've studied leadership and SWOT analysis and all that stuff, accounting and internal rate of return and finance. I'm going to challenge you guys to uh, not just put that away behind you because you got a good grade in the class. When you, when you start your jobs and start your careers or you expand your careers after this, bring it to the workplace. You see a problem, you're going to, you're going to pull out your plan do check act, your DMAIC, your A3 problem solving, your fish bone diagrams. You're going to use all that and you're going to blow people away. Don't be shy. That's the first mistake, not using what you learned. Okay. Number two, um, you're going to worry about the wrong things. I've seen people do this and I, students do it. And um, this idea that we're worried about, um, I turned down a job once because I was worried it was an extra 15 minute commute. And it was a really good job. And I still lose, live with that today. So like, that's not something to worry about. You can deal with a 15 minute extra commute. Um, the people that have thrived, thrived in my world. They don't worry about job title or pay. They just say yes, they jump in. And guess what? They've all get rewarded. So I've had other people over the years that say, well, I'd be happy to do this, but I don't feel comfortable doing it until I get paid for it or a title. And it just, it's just, I mean, it's your choice. Um, it'll be a hindrance in your career. I say, jump, jump in, do it, show your skills, show off what you're capable of. And the rest will fall in line. I promise you that I've seen it a thousand times. Um, and then, you know, don't worry about things like conflict and you got a boss you don't like or a person like just remember this one quote because it stuck with me for 25 years. Um, nobody wins when there's conflict. It's really true, right? So you get conflict with somebody, use your toolkit, bring a science to the problem, solve the problem and move on. Um, so those are what not to do. Don't worry about the wrong things. Um, the third one's kind of a personal one because I wish I would have really listened to my finance class 30 years ago. And this one is... Uh, is a personal one, just don't sleep on compound interest. I don't know if, <laughs> if that registers, but I'm telling you guys, uh, just here's my personal advice. When you come out of college, you guys are just getting started in your career, just put 5% in your 401k on day one. And then every time you get a raise, put an extra percent in there and you won't even notice it. And then when you max it out and then just leave it. And I don't care what you make, you'll be you'll you'll retire with um, just fine. The math works every time. So remember that uh, compound interest is, is the, you know, the eighth wonder of the world. We read that. Okay, here's the things I would say uh, do do for a successful career. So a little bit of the opposite of that, but also um, number one is go to the Gemba. You can't forget that. Every leader that I've ever worked with is successful goes to the Gemba. If you don't know what Gemba means, it's the point of delivery of the service, point of value. It's where the work is done, right? So the work is not done in my home office here. Work is not done in our corporate office. The work is done where the supplies are received, delivered, consumed. Uh, you got to get to the gamble as much as you can. And sometimes it's hard. And then in supply chain, sometimes it means getting up at five in the morning, four in the morning. Uh, sometimes it means you go in the work boots and you, or in hospitals, you suit up with gowns on, whatever. That's what the gamble is. You got to go see the gamble. You got to learn. You got to teach yourself what to look for. When you walk into, as a supply chain leader, you walk into a warehouse or a manufacturing, you need your eyes to see. It's a Womack book you should read as well. Your eyes to see where's the waste. Where's the flow of materials, right? There's seven flows, flows of people, material, equipment, data, engineering, et cetera. You need to see those flows. Take a package, follow it from one end, from whip all the way to point of delivery. Just follow that package through. And while you're doing that, you look for waste, you look for whip. Where there's whip, there's waste, there's a defect, right? The Gemba is the only place you can see this. So Gemba, Gemba, Gemba. I just, I can't say that enough. And safety is part of that too. A good operations leader, a good a good leader in supply chain is a safety is cares about people cares about the safety of their staff, but it's so much more than that. You got to understand the mechanics of safety, the the methods of safety, what it means to have a safe culture, how to look for waste, how to mitigate waste or um, risks. And so when you walk into a warehouse, right, you should see visual factory. You should see the flow. You should see if they're on or below the, their tack time. You should know what tack time is. You should see the whip. Right. And you should see the hazards. These are all things you got to see. And you guys are all capable of this. And that that will set you apart. Just you just you're always, always watching the gamba, the materials. Okay, number two, um, relationships matter. So I can't say this enough. Um, to be a great leader, I heard a quote once. Um, 
everybody that's in the senior leadership role is intelligent, of course. Every one of you students that got into the MBA program at the UW is highly intelligent. There's no question about that. But the difference between some of your careers and others will be your emotional intelligence, right? So what do you do about that? You can study emotional intelligence, right? It's self-regulation, self-awareness, motivation, um, effective communication. You can work on it. Um, you got to be good at emotional intelligence. And that's part of relationships, right? Um, when I got my MBA, the professor looked at all of us last at the end of it and said, look around. These will be future executives in supply chains. And I'm going to give you guys the same speech. Look around. You guys will be future executives. And many of you will get jobs from somebody in that room or will give a job to somebody in that room. Because I personally was recruited by people in my class and I gave jobs to people in my class. And over the years, I've probably uh, helped 20, 20, 30 people get jobs under, under me over the years um, because relationships matter. Now you gotta watch out for adverse selection and be fair and, and inclusive, but, but relationships are the key to, to the big key to your success. Um, okay, the last, my last point is, uh, I started by saying supply chain, the vocation, the profession of supply chain is an elevating, I think it's elevating uh, science. I think it's a profession that's being elevated. You see colleges now offering supply chain courses that wasn't as normal 10, 10 years ago. Um, the industries need you. We live in an area of the Northwest where supply chain is thriving, right? There's demand for this. This is your skill, your, your, the only person that cares about you graduating is you. The only person that controls your resume is you. It's the only thing, the resume is the only thing that that you can get that nobody can ever take away, right? This degree you're getting here, um, you earned it. You guys worked super hard for it. You wrote a check for it. Many of you uh, made a value decision to spend a fair bit of money for this, but um, it will pay off and it's it's yours. It's, it's nobody can take it away, um, but don't stop learning. Right. Don't ever, ever stop becoming a practitioner of what you do and the science behind leadership, supply chain. If you're, if you're going to go to the finance side, continue to grow and develop. And I, I mean that whether it's problem solving, um, what are your skills at problem solving? How do you continue to grow at problem solving? Um, OK, I'm going to leave you with a quote and we'll take questions. One quote I wonder. So and I believe this. We are not participants in this field together. We are architects of the future. So I do believe you guys um, made an effort to come here tonight. You care about your future. Uh, you are you are going to make a difference. Don't go into your job thinking you're just going to go to a job. You're going to go in there and you're going to redesign it. You're going to improve it. And you're going to have a best in class supply chain. Never stop. Never stop learning. Never stop improving. Plan, do, check, act. Just keep it rolling. All right. I'll take... Uh, Questions? Tell me how we're doing on time, Dan. I think we're doing great. Amelia, yeah. you've been, are you looking at the chat room? Do we have questions coming through the chat room? There was a question about, can you say more about this term Gamba? Gamba. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, a Japanese term. You know, there's a lot of terms that come out of uh, studying Japanese lean. By the way, I think anybody in supply chain should be lean certified. I know there's courses, you guys may have had that in your coursework. Um, many of you survived the, I call it the COVID education too. So I had students I hired and said, well, we had lean classes, but we couldn't do a project because it's COVID. Okay, well, I'm going to put you to work. We're going to do some lean projects. So a lot of terms, Muda, you know, all those terms come out of, out of lean, but Gemba is the term for where the work is done. There's probably other ways to describe it, but, but you got to get to the Gemba. Um, I don't really know how else to say it. Because so many leaders think they understand the work, but you really don't understand until you see it. You have to see it and watch the work, talk to the caregivers doing the work and watch the seven flows, study the seven flows. Um, it's part of lean as well. And you'll, and you'll start seeing these things and it happens at the Gemba. And it just, you gotta go to the work is where the work is taking place. Aaron, do you wanna go ahead and speak your question? Or can you see it, Rick? 
can you see there's two questions on the in the chat room i don't know if you can see um, them I s oh let me click on chat here we go i see one or two okay here we go so the first one is gamba uh when you, it's g e m b a i believe okay and then the second question is how I, how is ai changing the way you're hiring folks right now or should companies be adjusting their hiring strategies going forward it's a really good question. I know. So I'll tell you guys, my, my son's a computer science student at UW. And, uh, you know, we talk about AI every night in our house. It's scary. It's it's uh, it's intimidating for somebody coming to the workforce thinking, what is it going to do to jobs? They say 40% of our jobs are going to change over the next 20 years. And I continue to tell my son, yeah, but from the time the wheel was invented, dynamic change has been happening in, in the world, right? You just you can name off, I could talk about it for an hour, all the things that have changed and continue to change. When the internet started, things changed. People lost jobs. People gained jobs. The question is, um, where do we? Which side of the history are we gonna land on? I think AI is gonna create a ton of opportunity. I don't. You know, we're not on the computer science side in our supply chain, um, so I don't know. I don't know how it's gonna change our hiring. I'm looking for people, but I will continue to look for people that are all the things we just talked about: really good problem solvers, understand the science of of uh, supply chain and good with relationships because i'll tell you this ai will only work with good relationships it's just a tool that's going to layer on top and it doesn't take away the fact that the human interaction the human intelligence is what makes our world work so uh, to me it doubles down it doubles down this idea that you got to be really good at these things and really good with people but i'm convinced that there's still going to be high demand for good people that are that have the right skills that are good relationships going forward uh, it is it is it is an interesting time though. um okay next question thank you for your time i've heard a lot about medical supply chains are very complex they are what systems are being developed to handle this complexity ordering systems okay well we're what we're doing specifically in our world is um it's not, it's not super sexy here, but we're really trying to get the clinician out of touching, supp ordering supplies. So we, we did our time studies. We're 18 times more cost effective and efficient when my team orders the supplies. We have some pretty advanced systems where we, we scan and automate and do it as efficiently as possible. We're 18 times more efficient than when a clinician looks at a bin and has, thinks they want to order something and goes back and keys it in. So when you hear that, you think about a nurse and a shortage of nurses, you sure as heck better just focus on supply chain, moving to the top of their license and managing all the supplies. That's our big push. We're making tremendous progress there. And as good as we are, we still have pockets. These are simple things where um, maybe it's legacy at a hospital where they, they, they stock the supplies in a room and come back later and scan it. That's pure waste. So I, I just look at everything we do and just the culture shift. You got to look at, all the waste that maybe the frontline people don't see first time. No, they'll tell you the waste. When you when you do lean and you train folks and you ask them, they know the waste. They see it. But you got to challenge these things. Why do you go back to that room a second time? Something as simple as that. It's twice the labor. It's twice as many steps. It's pure waste. So as complicated as things are, and as, as, as much as everybody wants to automate and go to this sexy model where cameras look at the room and reorder, I'm going, that's not the problem. The problem is the person went to the room three times and they stood in front of the elevator and the elevator, when the patient comes, you get bumped out, right? So you have to wait and elevators take 20 minutes. You spend an hour of your day standing in front of the elevator. Let's go back to the basics and figure out how to get to that room every other day instead of touching that room three times a day. So even as all these things are complicated and automated, being really good at the basics is, is something I would encourage. So, Rick, I, I had a question about this issue around getting access to your supplier data, right? Because if we think about AI, it's this the possibility of sort of optimizing across a whole bunch of suboptimal silos. But what's the process of trying to negotiate with your suppliers to get access to their data and then getting access to their their suppliers data? What's that what's that look like? Yeah, that's that, you know, it's like you're in our head a little bit. Um, Dan, we 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 made a move, strategic move seven years ago to to do single channel distribution, which could be contrary to some marketing strategies where you divide among multiple vendors and 
and uh, compete. We said, no, we're going to go with one vendor, one distributor, and we're going to push as much business. We're going to create a strategic partnership. Never been done like this in healthcare before. We pushed $600 million of, of products to this one distributor. And we said, we're just going to do, we're going to share data. We're going to treat their inventory as our inventory. Yeah. We're looking to their inventory yeah. because we are just in time on those items. But yeah. we have 33 days on average of inventory at their sites mm-hmm. with the number one customer. How do we use that vertical supply chain to change healthcare? Where other healthcare systems are propping up warehouses after COVID, you talk to the colleagues across the US, like, well, we just got frustrated. We started putting up warehouses and adding inventory. Well, you can you can spend $200 million in a heartbeat in medical supplies. And that's not the right answer for us. So how do I leverage this this vendor, this distributor, to to be a highly reliable partner? And the only way it works is is, is data sharing. So we have actually FTTP or whatever connectivity. We have we have connectivity and we're sharing data. And we, I think it's groundbreaking. Again, it's not something that's overly sexy, but this idea of, of strategic partnership, um, looking at resiliency together. We we have you know we do QBRs together. We review the data together. We we've integrated in a way that nobody else has integrated. And again, that's the kind of stuff we study in a in a strategy book. And then you think, ah, oh, this is just in the books. No, we're, we're doing that. Strategic partnerships, vertical integration, that's all stuff that we are doing and building um, that's all true. Yeah, nice. Now we're trying to go further, right? So we have this risk sensing models and we actually have tools we built that say, hey, there's an earthquake in in um, some part of the globe, Italy. And the, the risk sensing tools say, okay, here's the products that are produced from that region and we can drill down. Again, this is all new for healthcare. And maybe, maybe other industries have this, but I want to know real time. Okay, we got, you know, Italy, for example, has very specific um, medical supplies for surgeries that come out of their region. I, I want to know the second it's on the news, what, what we're being impacted by and start working on mitigation plans. Okay, next question. What information system should we become aware, expose, invest our time in? Whew, I don't, I don't know if, um, you know, I've worked... In, in multiple industries, they're all, they've always been different. I've put in multiple ERPs, I put in SAP um, in one, one my last two companies ago. Um, I led our, our change to Oracle at Providence. We led the operational side of that. That was a two years of a very difficult lift when you do an ERP at that scale. And um, I, I don't necessarily think you can go study that and be ready for it. But what I would say is when you guys, when you do get into your work in the Gemba, you really got to understand how the ERP works and be inquisitive, you know, have, have that in, in um, curiosity is a really important factor I look for in hires. Be curious how the ERP works. Be curious how materials flow through the ERP or with the ERP. You know, sometimes, sometimes the ERP is your worst enemy. Sometimes planning modules is your worst enemy. When I went to, um, Distribution. I was distributing um, structural frame products, kind of Minnesota West was my territory. And when I started the job, we had yards full of material, and you could you could see the material went from it was like five years deep. And they were tagged with dates, and that was their SNLP system working, telling them to cut logs for future demand, and it was pushing this inventory into the into the into the system. And everybody thought it was the best world class. They're getting awards for this great inventory planning system. And it was creating stockpiles and stockpiles of waste. And so we had to strip all that out. And we, we did it through Lane. We built, we built regional hubs. We did a pull system. Just think, again, things, textbook things you're going to learn, you learned about. And we, we, we flipped the entire script and it was a multi-million dollar, you know, tens of millions of dollars saved. And it went from this highly advanced SNOP to a basic pull system that drove, drove a ton of value for the organization. Shortened the routing of trucks and, and, you know, aggregated the work and aggregated demand theory, which means instead of having full demand at every location, you can aggregate that and then the peaks and valleys offset each other. It was a really cool project. Again, you guys will have a chance that whatever industry you go in, you can transform it. I know that because I've seen it. Every industry has some broken pieces. Okay. Rick, last... real, yeah. real fast, if I could jump in. So one of our alumni was on your ERP team doing implementations. And I get a chance to see what people are doing at work I knew she loved her job. And from talking to you, it sounded like she was just knocking it out of the park. Why Why was that such a good match? And what are you looking for for people working on those types of projects? 
I love it. I love it. She was great. She is great. And I remember when she joined us, we we took her through a lean event, a Kaizen. I had her present. And, you know, from the day one, being slightly nervous at that, of course, to where she advanced a couple of years later, um, doing ERP trainings and and running our help desk and having total command of the business was just incredible to watch. So that person particularly had a hunger to learn. We talked about that earlier. That person particularly had a put me in coach attitude. I need you to go to <laughs> on an airplane every week to go somewhere. I got it, coach. Um, another thing is when we built our ERP rollout, you know, this is this is a whole other topic, but most ERP rollouts don't fail because the technology fails. The technology has been tested and retested. There's a whole team of analysts testing. Most ERP fails, and many do, because the business's processes don't align with the future state, right? Yeah. You have to do this as is to be, from current state to future state, and you got to build your business processes. That team that we're talking about, that that person was on, they did a full assessment of the current state. We did through our lean tools, again, value graphs and Fendi diagrams. We said, hey, what are we going to train on? What's our priorities? The day one, they had a whiteboard with 100 different things to build out standard works on. Again, this stuff matters. All this stuff matters. So they built out literally over 100 standard work documents, and they built out a training platform, call it our school, and they deployed that in their readiness assessments. And so that team crushed all that. So what was successful said yes. They use their toolkit and um, they all, they are all hungry to learn um, and they put science behind it all. Right. So that person was educated, willing to bring science to the workplace and it was very structured. Uh, and now we're doing some really cool stuff with that same team. We're past the ERP. We're putting in a pretty advanced uh, set of technologies across all our cath labs that they're deploying, which again, we're going to be out of time to talk about it, but um, that team is that team, um, has become a cornerstone of our operation. We kept those six people on our budget to do some amazing work going forward. Well, we're happy to hear that our graduates are doing so. One of our graduates <laughs> is doing so well. Um, so maybe should we cut here, Dan? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like about the right time. Rick, this was outstanding. Yeah. I like the the things we should avoid and the things we should do. Those are you know action yeah. items that we can each live by and. Um, I loved what you said about RFID. It was 30 years ago that people said it was going to transform the industry. <laughs> I'm not saying it didn't wasn't worth anything, but it didn't transform the industries. So yeah. Anyhow, lots of great lessons here tonight. Dan, thanks for making the, the introduction. Yeah. Rick, thanks for coming and and the students and visitors, thank you all for your participation. We really appreciate it. Rick, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Great job. We'll follow up with you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Okay. All right. Take care.